Okay, so hi, I'm Betty Swan. Welcome back to another lesson on wisdom in the night. Do you want wisdom? Of course you do. We all want wisdom. We wish we had it. We wish we knew how to get more. Well, let me tell you, you can get it a lot of ways. You can get it from good books. You can get it from good people. You can get it from God. You can get wisdom. And the Bible says in Proverbs, and with wisdom, get understanding. So it's not just that you get the knowledge. You've got to know what to do with that knowledge, how to use it, how to help people with it. Today, I'm going to talk about something that, oh, it's so hard to go through. Oh, my goodness. When God seems silent, it's like, I pray, I pray. Is anybody up there? Anybody listening? I don't hear anybody. I don't see anything. Have you ever felt like that? Oh my, it's so hard, isn't it? But did you know there is a purpose in God for that? It's not a surprise to God that he's got this plan of being silent. It's not an accident. It's not like, oh boy, you've been bad. I'm not talking to you. It's not any of that. There's a purpose in it. And I want to teach you so that when you experience these times of God being silent, you can relax and not be panicky. Instead, you can be patient and wait. But I'm going to talk about it today. So as you begin your walk with God and you begin to say, hear people say, you know, God talked to me. God said this. God said that. And you think, well, how did you know that? Did you hear a voice like from heaven or something? How do you know? Well, the Bible says in John 10, 27, my sheep, and we are his sheep. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. So there's three verbs in there. Hear, know, follow. A shepherd knows his sheep, and they know the shepherd, and they will not follow a strange shepherd. They only follow the one that loves them, protects them, and they feel safe with. And so there is a voice. God does have a voice. First of all, I want to talk to you about how does God talk to you? In what ways? It can be through a sermon, a song, something you read in a book. It can be in a dream, a vision. It can be a voice you hear in your head or inside you. And you think, I don't talk like that. I don't, I don't talk like that. How did I hear that? What was that? Who was that? That was the Holy Spirit talking to you. It's Jesus. You know, Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit are all the same, but they're all different because they all have individual jobs to do. Jesus' job was to come and die for your sins. God's job was to watch over the whole earth. And, and he's the only one that knows when Jesus is coming back. Even Jesus doesn't know. Even the angels don't know. But God is over everything. And Jesus is his son. The Holy Spirit is the comforter, the teacher, the corrector, the guide. He's in us. He's on the earth. Jesus is in heaven with God. God's in heaven. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God, but he is interceding for you. So when you think, I don't hear him and he's not doing anything. Well, what if he's praying for you right now? What if he's very busy thinking about you, talking about you? And he has his own reasons for not saying anything. Recently, God told me about a year ago, Betty, where I'm going to take you next, you're not going to be able to handle it on the short, quiet time that you have with me every day. Now, I've had a quiet time every day for 50 years. I've seen many miracles, many signs, many wonders, but people healed, people saved. I've seen it all. It's been wonderful. But God said, where I'm getting ready to take you, you're not going to be able to handle it. You're not going to have the wisdom. You're not going to have the strength. You're not going to have the ability to handle the people you're going to be working with 
or the persecution you're going to encounter. And you've got to greatly increase your time with me. So I did that. I went up to two hours a day for, oh, at least. I've done it out of the last year, seven years, seven months without stopping. Then I stopped a little bit. I had surgery. I didn't feel like doing anything. And then do it again. Then sometimes struggle, do an hour. Always like 30 minutes for sure. But no, and don't do that. But it's got to be more than that. You've got to be ready. In fact, he told me. I heard this in my heart. In here, I heard it. If you don't do it, I'll get someone else. I said, I'm doing it. I am doing it. I know what all you've told me you're going to do with me, and I, nobody else gets to do it. It's my call. So what do you want? And I'm going to do it. And I did it. But I didn't hear God talking to me. And I, finally, I said, Lord, I don't understand. I'm doing more than I've ever done to be alone with you. And why aren't you talking to me? I'm not hearing anything. All I heard after one month or two hours a day was doing it, keep going. That's all I heard. So what did I do? Kept going. Do it, do it and keep going. Still didn't hear God. One day I said, Lord, I don't understand it. You, you told me you just wanted to be with me. You told me, get up, pray in the Spirit, then listen to deep worship music, and then get in my presence. And don't pray about anybody, and don't pray about anything I've told you I'm going to do with you. Only be with me, Betty, alone with me. I just want us to be together. And I did that. And I said, Lord, I don't understand. What am I missing? What am I doing wrong? It's not working. And you know, the Lord said, do you and Bill talk all the time? I've been married 54 years, and we still love each other so much, maybe more than ever. Uh, do you and Bill talk all the time? I said, oh, no, Lord, we, we just are together. We don't talk. We just, we're together. That's, that's it. And then we talk. Of course we talk. But we don't have to at all. We can have a lot of time we don't talk to each other. God said, that's what I want with you. Everybody wants me to talk. I don't want to talk. Sometimes I just want to be with the people, just together. And so I thought, okay, all right, I'll do it. you got to show me how to do it. I, since I'm not going to be hearing you, evidently, just a little bit. Heard just a little bit. I'll tell you one thing he did tell me about New York City, because I live in New York City and have been there for 11 years, coming from Texas, where I lived all of my life as a Texan. Uh, he said, I want you to go to every neighborhood in Manhattan and get on your knees all by yourself at a major intersection and read the verses I've given you out loud and pray for that neighborhood to get revival, to come back to God. Now, you may not understand New York City. It's really five boroughs, five areas. New York is Manhattan, Staten Island, Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx. But when he told me to go to the neighborhoods and pray in, for Manhattan, you have to understand, New York, Manhattan is tiny, 13 miles long, two and a half miles wide, and thousands of giant, giant skyscrapers. And 8 million people come in every day for work. But each little area of Manhattan is considered its own little neighborhood, like uh, Greenwich Village, that's the West Village, the East Village, Soho, Tribeca, Upper West Side, Upper East Side, Harlem, uh, Lower East Side, Chinatown. It's, it has neighborhoods. And you, when you live there, you feel it. You can always tell when you move into the next neighborhood. Not, there's no signs, but you can tell. It's just different. And so I went to, I think, 15 or 16 places. And I told my husband, I was scared to death. To do it. I said, if I get on my knees in New York City and I pray, what are people going to do? Are they going to spit on me? Are they going to cuss at me? 
My husband said, Betty, it's New York City. They're not even going to pay any attention to you. And they didn't. But that was the one thing I heard God say, go do. Out of all this silence. And I did it. I loved it. It was wonderful. Went down by Wall Street. Went to the Brooklyn Bridge for Brooklyn. Went to the Queens Mall. Prayed for Queens. Went to Staten Island. And I was going to pray at Staten Island Ferry. And my friend that gives uh, a food, has a food ministry there said, oh, no, Betty, come on, you go to a drug park with me, drug addicts. So I went there, led somebody to the Lord, prayed for all those drug addicts to come to the Lord, the whole island to come to the Lord. It was just a wonderful thing that God let me do. And it came out of this time when God was silent. He, I mean, I, I just can't tell you every day, nothing. But. Every day I worshiped him. I got on YouTube and I, I uh, searched deep worship music. And I want to tell you, it brought me into the presence of God over and over and over. I would literally fall on my face on the floor in my New York City apartment, weeping, crying over who God is, how wonderful he is. Just amazing God. And yet no talk, didn't need it. Got the presence of God. I knew he was there and it began to grow on me. Another thing I did when God seemed silent, maybe you'll do this. I decided I was going to use Google and with Google, I was going to type in what does the Bible say about and I would pick a topic. And then I would print it off of my printer. And sometimes it'd be 20 pages. I think what does the Bible say about God was 22 pages. I just did everything you could think of. Anything that sounded interesting to me, I wanted to know about it. What does the Bible say? Try that. It'll save you a lot of time looking up a topic. And I began to read those every day. Every day I would pick a different topic in this two-hour quiet time, maybe two topics, and then pray over them, pray over my own life, pray over my family, my kids, my grandkids, my friends, people I minister to. I, I did do that, but it wasn't during this quiet time because remember God said, don't pray for other people. But later when it was over, I would remember what I had read, what the word of God had said, how I had worshiped God, and I would find myself that is when I would pray for all these people. Just such a life-changing experience. I hope you'll do it. I will tell you another thing God told me to do. This is about <clears throat> the fifth month or sixth month I was doing it. So it had been like I had a knee replaced completely in uh, February and in uh, March my doctor was saying, you got to get outside and walk. Well, they wouldn't let us outside because of COVID-19. You couldn't go outside. And I said, Lord, what am I going to do? I've got to walk this leg, this knee. And he said, go up to the top floor of your apartment building. Walk the, line, the entire hall length of your building, praying for every apartment door and the people in it for salvation, healing, deliverance, and intimate walk with God. Now, remember, I only heard one little sentence. This went on. It took me, I've forgotten how many weeks to do it, but I did every single floor, prayed in the Spirit a lot. If you don't know how to pray in the Spirit or you don't do it, just ask the Holy Spirit. That's your language, Holy Spirit, and I don't have it. And I need it because there's times I don't know how to pray. And you know for sure I did not know how to pray for those people. And remember, it wasn't in that two-hour quiet time. It was that walk in the hall that he told me to do after that, after each time. So I did it. It was great. It was actually wonderful. Now I see people on the elevator that I don't know. And I look at them and I think, I prayed for you. You don't know it. You don't know me, but I prayed for you. So when God is silent, and you can't understand it, and you're desperate. Is that in the Bible? Oh, goodness. Look at Matthew 15, 
21 to 24. This is a desperate woman. She's not Jewish. She lives near Lebanon in Tyre, Tyre and Sidon. Right there, that's Lebanon. She was a Gentile. She wasn't even Jewish, but she was desperate. She came all the way to get to Jesus and said, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. Now she brought up the Jewish. She wanted to know, I want you to know I'm a Gentile, but I know your title. You're the son of David. For my daughter is possessed by a demon that torments her severely. But Jesus gave her no reply, not even a word. When God seems silent, He's not ever silent. He's just not talking. He's busy. He's doing something else. Using maybe language we don't even understand. I know the language of the Spirit you don't understand unless you get the interpretation. Well, then the, his disciples urged him, send her away. She won't leave us alone. Tell her to go away. She's bothering us with all her begging. And Jesus said to the woman, I'm only sent to God's lost sheep the people of Israel. But you know what that lady said? Even the dogs get to eat the crumbs off the table. She wasn't going to give up. She was desperate and he was not talking to her. So what happened? He said, woman, you're going home. Your daughter's okay. And she was. Why did Jesus not talk to her? Why is Jesus not talking to you when you're so desperate? Because there's a reason. Maybe he's trying to get you to really want it. Maybe he's trying to get you to think, now what is my real issue? What is the real problem? Maybe he's trying to get you to not rely so much on external. Somebody tell me, somebody tell me. But what do I know about God? What do I know he is? What do I know he does? And then God has a strategic timing. And He's waiting on that. Maybe he wants to stretch your faith. Maybe he wants to say, well, he trusts me when he can't hear me. Will he believe I'm helping him when I'm not saying anything? Will she? Oh, my goodness. It's one of the hardest tests you go through as a Christian. And it's even harder if you're an unbeliever and you're trying to figure out, God, if you're real, if you're up there, help me. I had a friend one time. She was a prostitute and a stripper in San Francisco, and uh, her husband got saved. He became like a Jesus freak, and she thought it was ridiculous. And she was still stripping and being, you know, call girl. And she decided she was going to kill herself. She'd had enough of life, disgusted, and she had a giant shoebox full of pills, so she just reached in there, takes like, everything she'd get her hands on. And she's, right before she lays down, she goes, okay, God, if you're up there flying around somewhere, he then help me. And she lies down to die. Doesn't hear anything. While she was passed out, a maid came in to clean the room, and the maid never came in to clean the room. They got her to a hospital, got her stomach pumped out, and laying in the hospital, she said, okay, you're real. I'm going to serve you. Tell me what to do. He gave her a ministry to prostitutes, and they said, Judy, you know our life. You understand us. You don't look down on us. You're helping us. We want to know the Jesus you know. So you see, sometimes God's delay in talking to you is not denial. It's got to come to this ripe fruit time. Maybe it was not quite the ripe fruit time. You might be in a test. Does God say, yeah, will you wait? It might be spiritual warfare. You have demonic, devilish things happen. You have people coming against you. Well, they may not be of the devil, but boy, they got a bad heart and they're going to try to stop you. You've got to learn to walk by faith and not by sight. And faith sometimes doesn't see anything happening and doesn't hear anything happening. And it is harder. You have to learn how to trust God in the silent times. Many times, God is building character in you and you don't see it.
Many times He's preparing you for a bigger thing, a greater thing, and it requires this quiet. He's not answering, but He is going to answer. I'm telling you, it is. See, we feel like I can make it through anything if God would just talk to me and just tell me, okay, this and this and that and that. And we go, okay, it's hard, <sighs> but I can do it because you talk to me. But you know what? There was a time God didn't talk to Jesus. Try that. Hanging on the cross, doing His assignment, knowing this is why I came. And two nights ago or a night ago, a night ago, I said, Lord, if it's possible, I don't want to do it. Let this cup pass me. I don't want it. And he had to do it anyway. And then he got on the cross and everybody mocking him. He was hanging there naked. Do you know that? No clothes. This precious, pure, humble man who came only as a servant to help us totally humiliated, family devastated, friends abandoned, all by himself. God, God, listen to what he said. Why have you forsaken me? Where is that in the Bible? Matthew 27, 46. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, I've heard it said why he did. Why God, he felt like God abandoned him. It was because he was so full of the sins of anybody who had ever lived. Any sin that had ever been done. And God could not look on sin. He's holy. He must have really trusted Jesus. He must have really trusted Him because you know what Jesus could have done right then? Yelled out, then I renounce you, God. You didn't help me. You didn't hear my cry. You didn't answer me. You didn't say anything. You left me alone. But did He do that? He could have. You and I can do it or we can do it the way Jesus did it. Suffer and do what you're doing because you know God's called you. It says he did it for the joy that was set before him. He despised the shame. Hebrews says that. But for the joy. And there was a time when God said, Welcome home, son. Welcome. I love you. Thank you. Thank you. Millions and billions of people will come to me and be with me forever because of you. So I want to tell you, if you're watching this and you've never asked Jesus into your life as your Lord, your Savior, your boss, giving your whole life, use me however you want to use me, Lord, I want to do your purpose. Listen, I want to tell you, most of the time it's great and you love it. It has its hard things. But I want to tell you something. There are people all over the world right now, dying for Jesus. I've worked in those countries. I've worked in a communist country where they were beaten and tortured. I've worked in Africa where there was political violence and they were just cutting off arms, heads, everything. I've worked where uh, AIDS was horrible in Africa. And then I've worked in Pakistan where you don't mention anything against the, the state religion or they'll kill you. They'll destroy you if they can get you. And yet people said, you're worth it, God. So I want you to understand something. You're going to have times you cannot hear God talk to you. Now, I'm talking about those of you that know how. I know, I know God's voice. I'm going to tell you how I am. You walk with God long enough. You, you spend enough time with Him. You know when those things you hear inside your body are not you thinking it. But you also know God from walking with Him so long. You know how God responds. You know when you feel something, but you're not hearing it, but, a, but you just know it inside you. You know that you know that you know. So wonderful. But then I'm telling you those times that you don't hear anything. Why aren't you talking to me? 
I want to tell you, be sure you worship God then. Be sure you tell Him, if you never talk to me again, I love you. I'm serving you, Jesus. I'm serving you, God. Holy Spirit, I can't make it without you. If you don't fill me with your power, I can't do the work of God. It's by your power. And be tenacious about it. Don't let go. There's somebody watching this show right now. You are so discouraged, disheartened. You may be in a prison for persecution, religious persecution. I'm not sure, but I think maybe. And somehow, some way, God is getting to you the understanding. You may not hear me. You may not be able to go to church. You may not ever be able to get around people that know me and love me. But I will never leave you, ever. I will never forsake you. I am always with you. I'll never, even places you go that I don't want you to go, I'm right there with you. He never is going to leave you. He is always going to some way, somehow, at some point, talk to you again. And you don't have to think that's not going to happen. It is going to happen. Just be ready, but learn how to trust God in the silence. Learn how to go on what you already know to do. Spend enough time with God. Be taught enough about God that you know His ways. You know, Moses knew His ways. And God said, Moses is a friend of me. I am friends with him. So you just identify with Jesus, with God, whether you hear them or not. Stay strong. Don't give up. Win.